for the last several weeks, we've been looking at the Christmas story in the Bible and trying to recognize and understand the gifts that have been given to us by the people in the Bible and the God that they serve. And it's interesting when we look at it from that perspective. First, we looked at the gift that Joseph and Mary gave to us simply because of their obedience. They were given a task by God that was absolutely overwhelming. And their simple response was obedience. And they did it. They gave birth to and raised the Son of God, the Messiah. And that could not have been an easy task. But they did it. And we still are benefiting from the gift that they gave us 2,000 years later. Then we looked at how God had planned this gift. He had planned it even before he created the world and everything in it. Being God, he knew what we were going to do with the world he gave us. And even though we made bad choices and we rebelled against him, before he started, he came up with the plan to save his people. And then we laughed a little bit about how some of us are pretty good at buying gifts and keeping secrets. And I consider myself pretty good at that. My kids don't generally know what they're getting. And in fact, I will actively divert them from things that they may think that they're getting. And and stuff. other people, like my daughter Angela, are not good at it at all. But what we found out is that Angela is more like God than I am. Because God spent thousands of years telling us what he was going to get us because he was so excited about it. He told us everything about this gift. He told us where the baby was going to be born, what the baby was going to do, who the baby was going to be born to, and how people were going to recognize it. Then he told us what was going to happen to this child. Hundreds of years, thousands of years before it happened. And then it happened precisely the way he said it would. He gave us an incredible gift, and it was so exciting to him that he couldn't even keep it a secret. We looked last week about how his gift removes something from us that our enemy continually tries to put in us, which is fear. We saw that the number one command in the Bible, the one that God tells us most often, is do not fear. Do not be afraid. And in the context of Christmas, every character in the Christmas story, when they were told what was going on, reacted in fear. And God said, Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid, Mary. Don't be afraid, Joseph. Quit screaming and settle down and don't be afraid, shepherds. <laughs> and then we saw how he tells us the same thing. And because he is our father and we can trust him, we don't have to be afraid. Now the truth is the world we live in does not know how to deal with people who are not afraid. A huge chunk of our economy is based on keeping us afraid. Because I was blessed with daughters, I had to become very familiar with the fashion industry. Yeah, I'm a guy. Fashion doesn't apply to us. The Levi's that we wear are the same as they were in the 50s, which were the same as they were at the turn of the century. Vans haven't changed. The only thing that happens is as we get older, our Hawaiian shirts get more colorful (laughs) and bigger. Now you may think, who is this guy on the platform who's not wearing a Hawaiian shirt? My family ganged up on me. (laughs) Rhonda says, you know how nice you look when you wear a, a, a coat and tie? Well, it's Christmas. You could do that. And I'm like, no, I don't want to do that. 
And Wendy says, oh, but everybody will like it so much. And I said, you have no idea how much of a mess I'm going to have to deal with if I show up in a coat and tie. <laughs> Every person that sees me is going to stop and want to make fun of my coat and tie, which you have. <laughs> and then Angela, my youngest daughter, she fights dirty. She says, Daddy. <laughs> I was sunk. So no Hawaiian shirt, and I'm wearing a coat, and a Hawaiian print tie. <laughs> it's got a surfer right there. Okay. But the way we dress is based on fear of what other people will think of us. Where we eat is because we're afraid of what other people think of us. The decisions we make, what kind of car we drive, where we live, who we vote for, what we talk about, it's all based on fear. Yet God says, don't be afraid. I'll take care of you. We know this world is trying to kill us. And God says, don't be afraid. I'll take care of you. And we've all been able to look back in our lives and see how God has taken care of us. And part of the gift that he gave us is not having to be afraid. Now, lately I've noticed, let's see if we can get this thing working, right? It's supposed to be a blue screen. There's a blue screen. Now, it's a Christmas graphic. Yay. As I was thinking this week, it occurred to me that there is a group that's involved in every aspect of this Christmas story that we have not talked about. In fact, most people don't. Every part of this Christmas story involves part of this group, and they've been neglected. They were waiting at the manger when Joseph and Mary got there. They were present in the manger when Mary gave birth. They were in the manger when the shepherds came to see the Messiah. Who is this group? The animals. Our celebration of Christmas is speciesist. We focus on people. We're neglecting the animals. And I got to thinking, what did the animals do during all of this? Did they know what was going on? Did they celebrate? And as I was looking into it, I found evidence that they did celebrate. Go ahead, Jack. Play the evidence.
Thanks, Jack. <laughs> have I mentioned before that I have a diverse collection of Christmas music? <laughs> oh, now, see, I've got to do this. That wasn't my idea. That was Rhonda's idea. <laughs> so, what we're going to talk about today is the last gift that we're covering this year. And this is the gift of working graphics. There we go. The gift of joy. Now, you see it in a lot of the Christmas cards. You hear it a lot. We even sing about it. But most of us don't spend a lot of time thinking about it because Christmas is so incredibly stressful. And joy seems to be the last thing that we focus on. But that's our mistake, not God's. It's talked about all through the Christmas story. In Luke chapter 1, starting in verse 39, I'm going to read it really quickly. But this is when Mary went to visit her cousin Elizabeth, who was pregnant with a baby, who we'll get to know later as John the Baptist. In verse 39, it says, A few days later, Mary hurried to the hill country of Judea, to the town where Zechariah lived. She entered the house and greeted Elizabeth. At the sound of Mary's greeting, Elizabeth's child leapt within her. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. Elizabeth gave a glad cry and exclaimed to Mary, God has blessed you above all women. Your child is blessed. Why am I so honored that the mother of my Lord should visit me? When I heard your greeting, the baby in my womb jumped for joy. I want to point out that the first human being that recognized the coming of the Messiah was a non-viable tissue mass that half our country wants to be able to kill. A fetus was the first human being to recognize the Messiah. The baby in my womb jumped for joy. You are blessed because you believed that the Lord would do what he said. How hard is it to be blessed by God? Simply believe he'll do what he says. But before Jesus was born, he was bringing joy. In Luke chapter 2, when the angel told the shepherds about Jesus' birth. In verse 8, it says, That night, the shepherds were staying out in the fields nearby, guarding their flocks of sheep. Suddenly, an angel of the Lord appeared among them, and the radiance of the Lord's glory surrounded them. They were terrified, but the angel reassured them, Don't be afraid, he said. I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all people. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David. And he says, you'll recognize him by this sign. You'll find a baby wrapped in snugly in strips of cloth in a manger. What did the baby bring? Joy. To who? everyone and not just everyone then everyone in Matthew chapter 2 when the wise men had traveled by following the star to Israel leading them to the newborn king of Israel by the way the current king was not particularly excited by this news In verse 9, it says, After this interview, the wise men went their way, and the star they had seen in the east guided them to Bethlehem. Let's see, yeah, there it is. It went ahead of them and stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were filled with joy. 
Once again, every aspect of this story brings joy. So, you guys have known me for a while. When I see something like this, the first thing I tend to do is make sure I know what they're talking about. I suspected that joy was not the dishwashing soap. <laughs> so I looked it up. What is the definition of joy? To experience great pleasure or delight. That sounds good. The expression or exhibition of such emotion. Now, by the way, you need to remember that everybody expresses or exhibits emotion differently. Not everybody's going to be jumping around doing cartwheels. Not everybody's going to be squealing. I remember figuring out how to tell when my grandfather was basking in joy. He was sitting there quietly, with one certain grin on his face. And he had just seen something that he thought was great. He didn't get up and fist pump. He didn't dance around. <laughs> he smiled. And people have said, well, he needs to react more honestly. That's who he was. But joy is the expression or exhibition of such emotion. It's a state of happiness or felicity. Felicity is a word that you can't say and be mad. I feel sorry for parents who name their daughter Felicity because you can't ever punish that kid. You did what with my car? Felicity. Felicity, it just... Finally, a source of cause, or a source or cause of delight. That's what joy means. This is what Jesus brought to the world. Now you think, well, that sounds like happiness. It's not. Happiness is different. Happiness is the emotion evoked by well-being, success, or good fortune or by the prospect of possessing what one desires. Happiness is what happens when we get what we want. Happiness is what happens when something that we want shows up. And this being Christmas, there are already gifts that brought happiness yesterday and have been pushed to the side today. Because this is fleeting. You hear all the time about people who set some goal for themselves, and they know that when they reach that goal, they'll finally be happy. And they reach that goal, and they're happy that weekend. And then they find out that their life is just as horrible as it was before. Happiness and joy are two different things. It says, what's the difference between joy and happiness? Joy and happiness are wonderful feelings to experience, but are very different. Joy is more consistent and is cultivated internally. It comes when you make peace with who you are, why you are, and how you are. Whereas Happiness tends to be externally triggered and is passed on to other people, things, places, thoughts, and events. People cannot give you joy, but people can make you happy. They can also make you angry. Joy is not like that. In Matthew chapter 3, Jesus had started his earthly ministry and he was being baptized by his cousin John, John the Baptist, who recognized Jesus before he was born. And when he was being baptized, it says 
in verse 16? Yeah, 16. After his baptism, Jesus came up out of the water, the heavens were opened, and they saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and settling on Jesus. And a voice from heaven said, This is my dearly loved Son who brings me great joy. Now, there is a lot that we can go into on this. We don't have time today. But I want to point out that this was before Jesus started his ministry. Why do we think that what we do for people will bring joy? Jesus hadn't done anything for God yet. But he was God's son and brought him great joy. I was sitting there on the front row watching my daughter dance. I haven't seen that in quite a while. I loved it. But she's still going to bring me joy today at lunch when she's not dancing anymore. It's not what she does, it's who she is. I love watching my other daughter, Wendy, when they're up here and they're singing and worshiping. But that's not why I love them. It's not why it brings me joy. What they do doesn't bring me joy. Who they are brings me joy. There are a lot of Christians who are waiting on God to do something they want done before they'll be happy with God. And that's not the way it works. Now, we've seen in the last few weeks that God gave us this gift. He saved us and made us right with him because it gave him great pleasure. God saving you gives him pleasure. It's almost like we could suggest that the benefits to us are secondary. You're so important to God that you deciding to be right with him gives him pleasure. So, Jesus coming gave God joy. But what's it do for us? You know, we're people. We're selfish. We're self-centered. Okay, but what's in it for me? Well, let's see if the Bible has anything to say about that. In John 15, 19, or 15, 9 to 11, excuse me, Jesus says this, I've loved you even as the Father has loved me. Think about that for a second. Jesus loves you the same way God the Father loves Jesus. Is God the Father angry with Jesus? Is God the Father disappointed in Jesus? Does God the Father resent the time that Jesus wants to spend with him? Then why do we think God's like that with us? Why do we think Jesus gets annoyed by us? Why do we think Jesus really wishes we'd come to him with something important? Why do we sit around thinking how disappointed Jesus is with us? Jesus said, the way God loves me, that's the way I love you. When you obey my commandments, you remain in my love, just as I obey my Father's commandments and remain in his love. Why is he telling this? I've told you these things so that you will be filled with my joy. Yes, your joy will overflow. Let me use one of the more inappropriate comparisons. Anybody in here have a toilet overflow? <laughs> that means that the stuff in the toilet gets all over everything around it. What do you think it's like when Jesus' joy overflows out of us. It gets all over everybody around us. And when you're exposed to joy and you're not familiar with it, you need to know what that is so you can get more. 
It's one of the most effective things that we can do. Everywhere we go, the joy of Jesus is overflowing onto the people around us. In Romans chapter 4, the Apostle Paul is quoting the book of Psalms. And he says in verse 6, David also spoke of this when he described the feelings of those who were declared righteous without working for it. In verses 7 and 8, Oh, what joy for those, excuse me, whose disobedience is forgiven, whose sins are put out of sight. What joy for those whose record the Lord has cleansed of sin. Being forgiven brings joy. Coming to the understanding that you and God are right with each other. And God wants you to be with him. God wants you to come to him. God is never carrying around the list of things that you've done that he's angry at because you've been forgiven. And that gives us joy. In Romans chapter 5, Paul says, therefore, since we've been made right in God's sight by faith, we have peace with God because of what Jesus Christ our Lord has done for us. Because of our faith, Christ has brought us into this place of undeserved privilege where we now stand. And we confidently and joyfully look forward to sharing God's glory. I don't know how we got there, but the word privilege in our culture is a bad thing. Well, guess what? You have undeserved privilege with God. It's not because you're such an outstanding person. It's certainly not because I'm such an outstanding person. It's because of the work Jesus has done for me. I have privilege. Privilege. For almost eight years, at least one of my daughters worked at Ancho's. My favorite restaurant. Not once did I get a better table or a quicker table because of that. <laughs> Them working there did not get me that privilege. I would have liked it. Now, it did get us quite a few tortillas every once in a while because they'd come home from work and the door would open and you could smell the tortillas. It's like, ah, girls are home. But we like privilege. And we have it with God because of our faith in Jesus. Now, the world that we're living in right now is not necessarily always a happy place. There are lots and lots of angry people. There are lots and lots of, lots and lots of disturbed people. There are lots of people doing things that other people don't like. And the truth is, that's the way the world always is. Just some of it happens to be hitting us in new and creative ways. So how can you have joy when things are not going the way you want them to? In 2 Corinthians, the Apostle Paul writes this in chapter 6, starting in verse 8. He says, we serve God whether people honor us or despise us, whether they slander us or praise us. We're honest, but they call us imposters. We're ignored, even though we're well-known. We live close to death, but we're still alive. We've been beaten, but we've not been killed. Our hearts ache, but we always have joy. Remember, happiness is based on circumstances outside us. Joy is based on what's inside us. We are poor, but we give spiritual riches to others. We own nothing, yet we have everything. My guess is you've been around people who place a great amount of value on things that you know are not important.
there are times when we're with people and we're listening to things they've been doing and they've just been going places and doing things and there's things that I'd like to go do but we've never been able to do that and I can remember sitting there in my head going man what a life I would love to have done all this and then the next time Rhonda and I were sitting down eating with our girls God said you know They've never done this. Would I trade a trip to Hawaii for a lifetime of dinner with my girls? Not a chance. We didn't realize how much we'd miss it, but now that they don't live with us, we don't get to hear them laughing all through the night when we think they ought to be asleep. And we miss it but we got to have it. They had to realize this year that if they didn't step up and do something, we were going to have a naked Christmas tree in our house on Christmas. Because I'm not a Christmas tree decorator and Rhonda was busy. And so Wendy came over and decorated the tree. And I thought, oh, I miss this. We may not own much, but we have everything. He goes on in chapter 8. Now I want you to know, dear brothers and sisters, what God in his kindness has done through the churches in Macedonia. They are being tested by many troubles, and they are very poor. But they are also filled with abundant joy. And abundant means more than you can contain. It overflows. They are filled with abundant joy, which has overflowed in rich generosity. I've often joked about how much I'd love to be the guy that could write a million dollar check. That hasn't happened yet. That's still got five or six too many zeros on it for me. But you know, I can still be generous. I can give when God tells me to give. When I see a need, I can do what I can to help. It never comes down to one person. Oh, we need one person to give us $500,000 so we can replace the roof on this place. Well, if that happens, great. But it's not the job of one person. And joy creates an overflow in generosity. And that's not contingent on what's happening around us. The world that Jesus was born into was not a happy place. It was not a safe place. It was not an abundantly healthy place. How many of you ladies would, just for fun, try and give birth in a barn. With no drugs. Without any jello. Without an electronic meter to tell you when the next contraction is coming. So your husband can look at it and say, Well, that one wasn't that bad. And then they have to pry your hands off of his throat. Wouldn't it have made much more sense for Jesus to have waited until now when he could be born at a wonderful place like Loma Linda where our kids were born? That's not what happened. He was not born into a great place, but he brought joy. And wherever it is we're living, when we're with God, we can have joy. And in fact... If our lives do not exhibit joy, it's a good sign that there's something lacking in our relationship with God. Because God brings joy. God's gift is a gift of joy, real joy, lasting joy, not passing happiness based on our situation or circumstance but joy 
based on our relationship with him. And that's quite a Christmas gift. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for today. Thank you for the opportunity to remember how wonderfully generous and loving you are to your people. How you've gone through all of this so that everybody can be back in relationship with you, the relationship you created us to be in. Now we know, Father, that not everybody's going to take advantage of this, but everyone can if they want to. Everyone can have a relationship with you. And that relationship can bring joy. It can bring lack of fear. It can bring courage. All the things we've studied for the last few weeks. So, Father, I thank you for everybody that was here today. I thank you that your hand is on them. And as we watch a recreation or a representation of a little bit about the night that Jesus was born, remind us all that this really did happen and it happened for us. So I pray this in Jesus' name, amen.